right, welcome everybody. We're going to try to run uh, kind of a tight ship today, only because we're having a happy hour, as many of you know, beginning at 2.30, and we've got to get uh, a couple of our folks out to that, but I want to make sure that we get through everybody today. And you're all going to get to sample cocktails from our three panelists. So hopefully you have come thirsty, <laughs> yes? <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Steve Delinsky, by the way, from Chicago. I'm the food reporter at ABC7. Yes, a couple of Chicago people in the house. Thank you. Uh, this is like my 11th or 12th year I've been in Aspen, and it is such a pleasure to be back here. This is, as you know, the 25th anniversary of the trade program here for uh, American Express. Um, it's the 17th anniversary for Baltz and Company, and I want to give a big thanks to Courtney, Sarah, and Phil for asking me to be a part of this program again. Yes, let's have a little a hand of a yeah, little applause for Baltz. Absolutely. Um, social media, uh, a couple things. So hashtags, obviously Amex Trade, if you're going to talk about anything that's going on today, tomorrow, this afternoon, this morning, which was a great panel, Amex Trade, also FW Classic, and then the uh, Twitter handle would be at Briefing, and there's also going to be videos up um, after uh, Aspen Classic is going to have videos for all the restaurant briefings. We're going to tell you about that as well. So let's get right into this. Uh, it's all about shaking it up, using the bar to drive business. Um, many of you have businesses, some of you have cocktail programs, others do not. Um, I should point out right off the bat, this is not Dave Arnold. <laughs> uh, we have had major travel snafus this year. I barely got in yesterday coming out of Chicago. Lots of bad weather issues. Um, Dave was coming from New York. He's hopefully going to be here for the uh, happy hour, which starts at 2.30, um, but either, in either case, his drink will be poured this afternoon. Um, just so you know that Booker and Dax will have a representation here, but Dave is not here. So Josh, uh, Josh D Harris. Harris, I'm sorry, Josh Harris from San Francisco um, has a company called The Bon Vivants, which is a consulting company. Also uh, Trick Dog, which is a bar and kind of restaurant there, but mostly cocktail focused. Um, got a beard nomination this past year and um, also a nomination from the Tales of the Cocktail, the big prestigious cocktail event in New Orleans for world's best cocktail menu. So no slouch, um, good to have him here today. Also on my right, Charles Jolie, a fellow Chicagoan from the Aviary. Um, he just had a big honor earlier this week in New York City, the Diageo World Class uh, US National Award. So he's gonna go compete for uh, the US uh, in the international competition uh, in a couple of weeks, so congrats to you. But you are basically from the aviary today. And then on my far side, Kimberly Patton Bragg from New Orleans, formerly from Tivoli and Lee. Uh, she developed the whiskey program over there. She's now at Three Muses in New Orleans. And uh, she's in the Treme cookbook, and she's a big part of Tales of the Cocktail last five or six years, also a fencer. So uh, <laughs> let's begin. Um, now, the first question I have, I want to I have a couple of general questions, but I, I wanna, I'm going to get into some recipes and demos here in a second. But obviously, to be a bartender of any caliber, you've got to have tats. So what is with, <laughs> seriously, um, is, that, is, is that like a, a rite of passage in your industry? Pre-rec. Pre-rec, And okay. facial hair for the men. And facial yeah. hair for the men, okay. Yeah. Um, what's been, this industry has just exploded um, in all of your cities. I mean, your city especially, mm -hmm. Uh, what you guys are doing is on a world-class level. San Francisco has always had this incredible cocktail culture. Charles, um, tell me about Chicago, for example. How has the, the, they embraced this culture, and how have you been able to sort of stay with that and increase your education as well? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the craft cocktail movement has, has completely taken off. I've been in it from the ground floor in Chicago uh, back when I opened the drawing room about eight years ago now. Uh, and there really wasn't much to be had for cocktails in the city, and it's now, you need to spend five days just going to cocktail bars to see everything that's going on. Um, restaurants as well have definitely recognized that, and uh, there's not a restaurant worth its weight that hasn't uh, opened a, a great food program in addition to uh, a great beverage program, and that being cocktails, not just wine. And a decade ago, that would not necessarily have been the case. Uh, and we're seeing a ton of focus on not only cocktails, but uh, spirits and, and uh, NA drinks and all sorts of things that we can use to enhance our, our venues. And Josh, with respect to your consulting business, I'm guessing a lot of restaurateurs are coming to you and asking for help. How do we begin? How do we carve out this niche? And how do we raise some revenue? Because obviously, 10, 12, 14, $20 a cocktail helps the bottom line. Absolutely. There's a, your beverage program is one of the things that's going to give you a point of view at your restaurant. And so particularly in markets like ours where it's extremely competitive, 
each restaurant's coming out there trying to give themselves a competitive angle. And so if you're high in two categories and low in one, you're missing the boat. So everybody's trying to put all of their sort of channel it all to, to create the best facets of the restaurant to work together to become greater than the sum of their parts. And Kimberly, obviously people come to New Orleans to, to eat and drink, but have you had any challenges in just trying to get the diner, the casual, the, uh, the visitor for the weekend to really embrace cocktails that are worth the $12, $14 well, I, a piece? I think the difference is um, New Orleans has always been known for cocktails. I mean, it's, it's where everybody loses their mind, let's be honest. Uh, but now it's uh, stepping away from the hurricanes and the hand grenades and the DAC shops and all that. There's a place for that, absolutely. I'm not above it. However, um, now we have, we're going back to the classics and there's, you know, I, I focus on a contemporary culinary style. There are some beautiful things being done in New Orleans because it's such a food city that the bar is actually honoring that food culture as well. So it's become a really nice simpatico and there's some great stuff and we have a wonderful community there. All right, so let's begin. Um, I'm gonna start with Charles. Uh, you're going to take us through a cocktail. I'm going to ask you a little bit about what you're doing and how you're building it, yep. but tell me about what you're going to make first and why you decided this particular one yep. based on the spirits you've got. Uh, so this is one of our, our spring, early summer cocktails. It's called the Green Thumb. Uh, and, and I like this for uh, several reasons, and I chose it for several reasons. One, uh, it's taking a simple concept, the simple sour cocktail. Uh, think of... Uh, to get start making uh, any sort of interesting or advanced cocktails, you need to be able to make the basics first. And so the sour just being spirit, citrus, and something sweet to balance that out is what you need to nail. Think the margarita, think the daiquiri, uh, any of those cocktails would fall into that. This it takes that and then just it takes it up a notch. Uh, it also is an example of a, a great presentation uh, because our guests don't, all, don't only taste with their palate, they right. taste with their eyes. So well. much of I, what I've seen is about presentation from the pebbled ice to the big mounds of mint to, I mean, anything. Mm -hmm. is garnishing is a big part of training now? Bottom line, it's got to taste good, but once you have a cocktail that tastes good, you, need, you want it to look beautiful as well. The same thing when you're cooking a dish. It's not, if a, a chef goes to all the work to make a great dish and, and doesn't plate it nicely, if it comes out and, it, and it's a mess on the plate, it's not going to taste as good. Okay. It's just not, it, your, your mindset is off so, right away. So how does this begin with the gin? Cool, yeah, should we uh, okay. yeah, well, make why it? Not? Okay, yeah. and we're going to have, I know you've batched this out, so we're going to have samples for yeah. everybody in the audience. Yeah. Spit buckets as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, you no. won't need those. They're small, they're small samples. Cool, so let's, uh, let's, let's take this kind of from the top and from those, those basic uh, ideas, the building blocks of the cocktail. So we have a, uh, a, a snap pea syrup uh, that we've created. The one that we use at the aviary when we do it, we run it through a champion juicer and it's actually got this really bright, intense green to it. It almost, uh, it almost it looks neon, it almost looks like it's not real, but it is the actual color of the pea. This is a little bit, uh, not quite as bright. So let's stop for the, you just mentioned a tool, and I want to ask you about tools. Jiggers are obvious and yep. mixers and shakers, of course, but what was that champion? A champion juicer. A it's champion a basically juicer. a juicer that will take just about any fruit, vegetable, uh, that you can run through it and, it, and it'll get whatever liquid is so, in there to juice. So if I've got a restaurant um, in Denver, and I don't necessarily want to do the aviary and do molecular yep. mixology. Should I get that champion juicer though? Is that going to be a good thing for me to have, or is there a simple? I think one? your kitchen would use it. Okay. Uh, and these are, you know, the, the uh, line between kitchen and bar is completely blurred at this point. Uh, as bartenders, we spend so much time in the kitchen. Um, as I was learning uh, more in-depth cocktails, I had the fortune of working with a chef who was very open-minded, let me in his kitchen, taught me some culinary techniques, which now at the aviary is taken to the, to the next level. Because you don't have bartenders, you have chefs, right? Many of them have culinary backgrounds, yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Right. So you made this, uh, I'm sorry, what was it? It was a pea uh, juice, a uh, simple syrup, no. Yep, so you just take one part of uh, juiced uh, snap peas and one part sugar and combine them to make the syrup. Uh, just a little bit of fresh citrus, and then you know we're talking about your base spirit and making that simple sour. Here we're going to have uh, a Kobe spirit, both rum and gin in this case. And, and do you like? I mean, there are so many different gins and rums on the market right now. Yeah. Do you feel like if you're building a bar, can you do it relatively inexpensively, or do you have to go out and get exotic stuff to, to no, be impressive? No, you, you can start really, really basic. Uh, I mean, I've worked in every type of bar. Prior to working at the Aviary, I worked for a bar group. We opened seven bars around the country. Uh, everything from high volume sports bars to neighborhood places to 100% agave tequila bars, very early in the, in the game for that. Uh, and you know, starting with fresh juice, make a little simple syrup, it's sugar and water, uh, and, and just get a good baseline of, of spirits that you like. Um, 
you need, you need to taste. You need to see what you like, what works for you, uh, and, and pay for what's going into the glass and what's inside the bottle, not for a billboard on the street. You know? Right, and why this one? Why this rum? Uh, Kanye Brava is awesome. This is uh, from the, a company called the 86 Co. It's actually founded by bartenders and by people in the industry who broke off, stopped their uh, jobs with uh, uh, working with big brands and said, you know, we're going to make spirits for bartenders. So this is a Panamanian rum. Uh, it's a white rum, but it's got a lot of flavor left in it though okay. as well. Now this uh, is sort of what all the, the beer geeks love. I've seen green chartreuse on tap at a bar in Chicago that, yep. called Sable. Yep. So everybody in the industry loves green chartreuse. Why and, and what is this and why are you using this? So chartreuse has a long, long history. Uh, it goes back uh, to 1605, actually. Um, but for, you know, at, at the very um, uh, basis of it, we can call it uh, a French herbal or botanical spirit. Okay. Uh, it's a liqueur, 110 proof. They, they talk about 130 different uh, botanicals in it. Uh, still, uh, the recipe is still protected by uh, an order of monks. It's not hype. It's true. I've been to the monastery. I've been oh. to the distillery. All right. Um, and what did you just add here? So we added a little bit of sherry, which is also another, another one of these uh, buzzing uh, ingredients. Uh, and it's something that, you know, sherry is, that really was not on the map in, in the United States up until a few years ago. Um, the United Kingdom drank by far the most amount of sherry. And some people have done some great work with the uh, Regulatory Commission of Jerez, which is where sherry is made in southern Spain. And uh, it's just an incredible cocktail ingredient. You've got all of these styles from... Uh, uh, very some of the driest wines in the world to some of the sweetest We're going all the way from a Fino to uh, Pedro Jimenez now you've been in this business for a long time but do you have time to do R&D it was my question for everybody here actually when do you have time you know when you're not behind the stick to actually come up with this sort of stuff when do you, do you devote time to training for your staff or do you just sort of sit down in your apartment and do all this? And when does this happen? I mean, it, it's, uh, you're constantly learning. Uh, we have so many resources available to us now. Uh, there's chapters of the United States Bartenders Guild in almost every state. You can get your staff involved with that. Uh, there's some great programs in Chicago and, and out of New York that uh, Chicago has one of the best educational uh, systems, actually. And at, um, it's very, very accessible uh, and very in-depth. But with the internet, I mean, all that information is out there. You can go out, there's really uh, talented individuals who have done videos and there's great books available. And it's not, you don't send your bartenders to bartending school. They're not gonna learn much, much of anything there. Okay. Um, but you know, the best way is there's find a mentor. Find someone who's got uh, the passion for it and then just get the fundamentals down. Uh, walk before you run and, and you can go from there. Okay, so everything went into the, uh, the yep. base of a shaker here. Yep. With ice. Yep, just a little bit of ice. Are you particular about the ice you shake with as opposed to the ice you pour over? At my bar, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so taking into account that this is uh, a smaller, kind of softer ice, uh, I'm not going to shake quite as hard as I would normally uh, because it's just uh, it's going to break up. It's going to add a lot more dilution. So it is something that we think about. Now, what is this? So this is the Perlini. This kind of you know is where we take that simple sour and then we've modified it with the sherry. We've modified it with the uh, the green chartreuse, and we're pouring it into this Perlini, which is a, a carbonator. Perlini. Perlini. Yes. Uh, you get these at Target, I'm sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the magic of the interwebs, right? Uh, but it's a, it's a carbonator, so just hitting it with CO2, and it'll carbonate the liquid that's in here. Oh, that's clever. And if, and if you're working in a bar environment where you're going through a high volume, you can have the little CO2 canister with the, a trigger gun off of it, and it, that thing will last you forever, 15 bucks of CO2, uh, and you don't need to buy the uh, little charges. It's not as wasteful. Now, if you were putting ice in the glass here, I'm guessing yep. it would be some kind of a fancy draft ice that yeah. six Himalayan women carved over the course of a weekend. You know, <laughs> it's uh, at, the very, at the very basis of... Uh, of your ice, you know, you just want a good dense cube. Uh, the go-to is the cold draft machine. Uh, cold draft with a K is really what we most of us use. Uh, the how, much, how much would that set you back? It's a, just about uh, ten percent more than a Hoshizaki general machine would be. Okay. Um, and there about are, twenty thousand dollars in repair 20. orders. Yeah, <laughs> they are a little exactly. temperamental, but Hoshizaki is coming out with mm -hmm. machines to rival that as well. Uh, and so, the more competition that happens in the business, the better the R and D is going to going to happen. And, and uh, less fighting with ice. Yeah. You all like the, the cold draft. No? When you get to your cocktail, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. So you just pour it over ice. Um, but again, would they be like the, they'd be larger cubes of it typically? Yeah, yeah. just four cubes would four fit cubes. in there. Okay. And, and you know, at the, at the aviary, the ice program is something that we take to uh, an, an obscene level, some would say. You have, uh, you have a, you have a full-time person, right? We have two full-time ice chefs uh, that we employ. Uh, and what is this? This is what, drinking a garden? Exactly. Tea? 
So is this, is, this, is, uh, this is the thing here. You know, uh, this will get served in, in the jar with the wheatgrass coming up, and then we'll even add on top of that pea tendrils coming out of it. So when this is going across the restaurant on a tray, it's, you get that, I want one of those moments that happen. Right, and right. you catch people, and if they're, you're in a dark bar or a dark restaurant, and there's, whether you're, you're, you're finishing and inflaming a drink at the, the table side or whatever it is, you catch someone's attention, you pique their interest, everybody wants one then. It's, yeah. Is it a little over the top? Hell yeah, but that's all right. You know, it's, it's, at, at its core, it tastes good. Uh, you know, we hit what? it a little bit with a barbecue aroma on the top. Uh, where we do an infusion of things like grilled onions. We really want to take you in your backyard and, and, and get you there. So as you sip this drink, it's bright, fresh, green. Effervescent, spring. obviously, because yeah. it's got the CO, yeah. And what is the, um, you've got a garnish in there as well. What yep, is that? the straw is an angelica stem. Uh, and so uh, these, before they flower, will actually be hollow all the way through. And so you could use a natural uh, plant as the straw. Please so feel free to take use, a sip. So you use nature. You employ Just nature a, quite a bit in your creations, it looks like. Uh, yeah, you know, this is the time of year. This is spring. Things are growing. It's, uh, oh, wow. you know, it's happening out there. So. Oh, that is beautiful, bright, light. Um, an incredible balance, too. Balance is so key that, when you're going to do this. That's the balance is the bottom line. I mean, I've got it on, tattooed on my arm to remind me uh, every day that this is what we should be striving for, regardless of what you're doing. Um, and, and that balance starts, like I said, with those fundamental building blocks, sweet, sour, uh, and your spirit, if you're going to do something shaken like this, uh, in, as opposed to a stirred cocktail. What do you think, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right, Charles. Thank awesome. you. Cheers. Now, and you're not off the hook. We might ask you some more questions. Yeah, but please. Certainly, you can relax now for a little bit. Um, I am curious. Before I get into Josh's, how do you how do you get um, sort of the casual diner to take that leap? Uh, part of it is marketing, right? Part of it is writing a good menu. You were talking to me about it earlier. How do you write something that looks enticing to someone? The menu to me is, is one of the most important factors of the drink program. Our opinion that we've cultivated is that there are a lot of steps that occur before the customer actually tries the drink. And so if you, if you really want to get heady about it, sure, it starts before they even walk into the space. You know, do you have somebody at the door? What does your restaurant look like from the outside? But let's sort of look at it from a more micro perspective. You come into the bar, you sit down, you have a menu in front of you, you have a, a mise en place, you have your garnishes looking a certain way, everything is fresh, there's no brown edges on your limes, your bartenders are dressed the way that you want them to, the lighting is right. They look at the menu, they understand what it is, you have buzzwords in there. One of the things that we try and do with our menu is create a range of cocktails that are gonna to appeal to the beginning drinker as well as the expert drinker, but that the expert drinker would like that drink that you sort of crafted for the beginner when they want something more refreshing or something easier. And at the end of the day, when that beginner takes the step to the expert cocktail, that it, it, it's not you know, sort of uh, unappealing flavors or it's too bitter for me that you have this whole range. So one of the ways that you do that is uh, you have buzz ingredients on there. You could take a drink with orange juice on it and you could put blood orange in it and you could throw some mint in it. You could put six other things in that cocktail that they've never heard of. They're gonna see blood orange and mint and they're gonna feel comfortable. They're gonna be interesting ingredients that seem fresh and then all of a sudden you're selling them a bourbon cocktail because you had bourbon, blood orange, mint, and some seltzer water in it. it so It's almost like they've gotten two inside baseball in some cases where I'll just see a menu and like one drink will just say bullet, angostura, luxardo, simple. You know, I understand that, but I think very few people would understand all of those things, right? So you, you've got to, you're not dumbing it down, but you've got to make it more understandable. Sure. I think that it's also something that you can tailor for the restaurant or the bar that you're in. So if you have something that's a little bit more high volume, you may want to give people more information on the menu. And if you have a place that's going to be slower or more of a restaurant, and you want to facilitate interaction between the bartender and the guest, yeah, you could write your menu a little bit more vague. I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of like the four word lines, but you could write it a little bit more vague because it's ultimately gonna facilitate the interaction and then create a relationship with the bartender and the guest or the server and the guest. And one last question before I have you go to work. Um, if you're consulting me, I'm opening my place. I've got a, a restaurant that I'm really proud of, but I wanna do a bar program. Ballpark, how much might I need to, need to invest in like equipment, tools, a champion juicer, um, you know, anything that you think I need to get going. Sure. What do you think? 20,000, 50,000? I don't 
I don't mean to shirk the question by saying it's a tough question. Uh, obviously, if you're building a, a bar or restaurant from scratch, you're gonna be investing in, in a significant amount of bar equipment. Uh, one well to three wells, it's obviously, you know, you'll, you're gonna double and triple your costs just on the size of the bar that you're creating. Uh, ice machine and juicing, that's all one-time purchases. Bar tools can be done fairly inexpensively. There's a site called barproducts.com that has nice stuff, and Cocktail Kingdom, you can buy this stuff online. Barproducts.com, yeah. okay, I want that. Um, and then also, um, and in terms the, of a back bar, do you need to have the expense of Pappy Van Winkle's back there to impress people? I think that your back bar is all about adding value and credibility to, to, what, you're, to what you're offering. At our place, we don't carry Pappy Van Winkle. Uh, we don't carry it for a specific reason that's not relevant to go into now, but point being is that nothing is lost with us not having it. If you have bottles that are interesting and if you have bottles that your staff stands behind and you have your staff educated on what those things taste like, you're gonna be able to offer a comparable product. Uh, I think that there's just as much merit in creating a back bar that is extremely, extremely curated because anybody can buy every bottle in the book and stick it on the shelf. You know, it's about having a point of view. And sure, some concepts are, are about having an exceptional amount of whiskeys and, and that's really cool, but just to have the stuff to have it, I mean, you're sitting on tens of thousands of dollars, a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle, I mean, you may sit on for three, four years, depending on what kind of place you are. It's like, what does that do for you? Okay, so let's get started. So what are you gonna make for us? I'm doing a variation on a daiquiri. All We've right. seen a little bit of a daiquiri. resurgence with the handshake and daiquiri, as I'm sure uh, <laughs> KPB yeah. is well aware of in New Orleans. So and much better. <laughs> Your traditional. Is, is, this, is this like a Hemingway drink, like, like Florida or well, so Havana? Right? There, there is a Hemingway daiquiri, which is a different cocktail, and it is a, a, also a variation on a daiquiri. But in its most basic form, a daiquiri is rum, lime, and sugar, uh, which also may sound familiar as a gimlet, which is vodka, gin, lime, and sugar. Uh, and they're all very close relatives of, of what Charles created with a sour or a daisy, a margarita. They're sort of all in that sour category. And daiquiris were something that people sort of shied away from in the 80s when things started coming solely out of slushy machines and juice wasn't fresh and you had commercial grade simple syrup. You was, the, was the slushy machine for all of you like fingers on a chalkboard? Well was now I'm sure we all love yeah. slushy well, machines you know, but it's, however, it's a little tongue know, in cheek. There yeah. are actually some uh, good things uh, being done with slushy machines. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, I've, um, there's a place actually in New Orleans do, that does a really killer Pimm's cup that's out of a slushy yeah, machine, right. so. But, but in terms of the it's, 80s it's, and 90s. Yeah, oh yeah, but that was garbage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, just wanna make sure, all right. So this, yes. co this cocktail is extremely simple, and there are layers of flavor, and the things that are gonna make it are the strength of the ingredients. You have fresh lime juice. Obviously in California, we have an abundance of fresh produce. California, specifically San Francisco drinks, have always been really produce driven because there's an abundance of fresh produce all the time. We get great citrus. So, all right. what we're doing, I changed this traditional daiquiri recipe by taking out the rum and putting in this product, which is called Ancho Reyes. And it's new. And it's the only thing that is like it in the entire world of spirits. And what it is, it is a, a chili liqueur, primarily the flavor of the ancho chili. There's a few other chilies in there, so you get a lot of the earthy sort of base notes of the ancho and you get some high notes with a little heat. And is this something where you gotta know a guy who knows a guy to get the bottle? Or not, not at all, okay. not at all. It, it is new, so it may not be in all of your states, but within a very short period of time, it will be readily available through a major distributor. Cool. Um, and so, basically our daiquiri recipe is, is two ounces of spirit, one ounce of lime, and a half ounce of sugar. And I always have notes on the sugar. Simple syrup, when people talk about simple syrup, it's one part water to one part sugar. The only other way that I've seen people make it is rich simple syrup, it's two parts sugar to one part water. So when you're reading recipes and you're trying to recreate them, that's the thing that's gonna create the balance is whether you have, you know, how your chef is making the simple syrup. So we're gonna start with two ounces of ancho reyes. It's a beautiful color, by the way. Wow, it's really yes. lovely. It's great juice. Yeah. Great juice. Great juice. And then we have an ounce of lime juice. And do you have somebody just all day long pounding fresh limes like in a press or what are you doing? You know, uh, the, the juice program is, is kind of a big deal at, at our place, Trick Dog. Um, this is just a half ounce of two to one simple syrup. Um, I guess this is the caveat. I think it's great that you're seeing a range of styles. I've been to the aviary. If any of you guys ever have a chance to go to the aviary, it is a, a spectacular thing to see, and nobody's really doing anything like what you're doing in the world. And this is an awesome counterpoint to what that is, in that you can create layers of flavors, 
And ultimately, it's just about the experience that you want to give the customer. It's like, are you higher volume? You want to do fewer ingredient cocktails? You have a slower pace, and you want to make it more about sort of the experience of the drink? Uh, it, but it's, the, also it's, it's like there's nothing that's one is better than the other. I think the main thing is that you tailor something to your concept and what you want to get accomplished. But training is an issue. He, the, he's going to spend more time training his staff than you're going to, if, right, if less complicated. Well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. so how much time do you spend in a given week with a staff? We have training. ongoing training, and right. I think that when you get to sort of the level of, of the bars that we're putting together, we have regular mandatory things that are built in. Uh, we're also starting, I believe, with a higher base of bartender with more experience mm -hmm. because we're able to sort of handpick some people. But the main thing is that you don't bring everybody in for your traditional opening, everybody gets trained together and then sort of send them off to the wolves. It's really important. I know that there's restaurants in our city where they have the mandatory meetings and then every week, you know, the wine director, for example, will hold uh, a weekly wine meeting. And you don't have to come, but when you build that culture around your staff, everybody comes because they realize that, that knowledge is power and power translates into money. And, you know, when you're serving at a restaurant, that's what you want to be making. Okay. Um, we okay, made a so decision. Your ice is going to be what? Uh, hand, no, this is just uh, chainsaw, you said. Yeah, well, this <laughs> is just hotel ice here, but we. Not, we, not here, yeah. but in, in, if you had your druthers. We have, we, no, we use cold draft as well. And uh, we use cold draft because there's not a better alternative at this point. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell anybody here to run off and buy a cold draft machine because they do break. And it is a huge pain. Uh, the ice is great, the customers appreciate it, it makes a great drink, um, but you have to be prepared for what comes along with it, and hopefully there are other alternatives that are coming soon. No, but you told me that this is like a, a thing every day, you're outside. Well, totally. So we, we have three different kinds of ice. We have a, a crushed ice machine, which is great, like pellet ice. They're small, they don't take up a lot of space. Um, oftentimes kitchens will use that kind of stuff too, which is a nice crossover. And then we have a cold draft machine, and then we make... Uh, we make cubes for, for whiskey drinks and, and whatnot, and we bring in crystal clear blocks. We actually do it right in front of the bar. Our bar backs have to cut it every day with a chainsaw. Now they come chainsaw it up. We keep it in the fridges uh, or in the freezers. The neighborhood comes out. Everybody takes photos. It's sort of like a neighborhood building thing, so we do it out on the street every day. And as long as you mention photos, I love to see everybody's different shake style, by the way. Um, as long as you mention photos, maybe you all can chime in on this social media. How important is that in terms of generating some buzz? I've been, a big, I've been a big believer in the power of social media. I think that you know, something as simple as an Instagram feed for your restaurant, you know, people are so visual these days that if you can create nice shots of your cocktails and mix it in with candid shots of your bartenders, you put your general manager on there, you say, I want you to take a couple photos a night of something, and you, you put something on your menu at the bottom, like follow us at this, you could even make a little competition or something like that, but we've seen an immense amount of support generated through the Instagram, because at the end of the day, you can't taste it, so you might as, well, might as well make it look really pretty. And people love to take photos of their drinks or their food, obviously, so. And this would, if you, again, if you had your choice, if we were in San Francisco, would this be just one big block of ice in there, in, in this glass, or would you have a couple of cold draft? No, uh, it would either be cold draft or crushed ice, uh, and I guess this is the caveat, because I'm not Dave Arnold. If I was doing this drink at my bar, I would shake this and strain it into a cocktail glass without any ice, like an old daiquiri. But on the rocks is also great and super okay. refreshing. And uh, just Fresh, take, fresh uh, zest? Yeah, just take a little peel of orange. You take this with the skin side down. You just Express zest it, it right over the top. You just touch it around the rim. A simple thing, yet adds such another dimension, doesn't it? And another little layer of complexity to the drink. Yes. And then you have essentially a really layered, slightly tart, slightly spicy, three ingredient cocktail. Three ingredients, wow. Yes, well done. All right, let's try this too. Mm, cheers. Cheers, cheers. Mm. Oh, and the nice citrus pop in there as well. And that's, that's your basic daiquiri. And I've, yet I've never had it, I mean, usually the daiquiris I have are up, but they're gonna yeah. have Luxardo or they're gonna have mm -hmm. more like the Hemingway style, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry, before you move on, I want to answer that juice question. Yes. So we made a decision really early on. We invested a, a, a significant amount of money when it comes to opening a restaurant into a, into a juicer called a Zumex. And if not everybody is familiar, it's the thing like if you go to the sort of the Mexican coffee shop and they're squeezing, squeezing oranges to order, it's the big orange thing that sits countertop and you put the oranges in a hole. Spent about $5,000 on a refurbished one of these and we have paid it off in spades mm. with labor mm -hmm. and no waste because you create pars and essentially 
if you had to have a guy come in for three hours before to be juicing for the kind of volume that we do, he's there for hours. With a Zumex, you dump a case of fruit in the top, you send your bar back off to go do the rest of his stuff. And then at the end of the night, say you didn't squeeze a bottle enough, in normal service, you're pulling your guy off the floor for 45 minutes to get you through the last hour of the shift. With this thing, you just throw another half a case of limes in there and it comes out in a minute. Mm. And uh, So like Craigslist or uh, eBay? Or? There, there are, if you type in Zumex, there are, there are companies that, that sell refurbished ones. It's Z-U-M-E-X. It's, it's the best, best yeah. investment we ever made. I've seen those at the Greek coffee shop in my neighborhood for orange yeah. juice, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, well thank you, that was fantastic. All right, so now, yes. Kimberly, okay, so I, no surprise here, she is from New Orleans, you can all guess what she's gonna make. <laughs> Sazerac, right? And a Sazerac, if I'm not mistaken. But I like whoever said Via Carre, that's awesome, so. Or Brandy Milk Punch. Exactly. Um, I was gonna say, this is the original American cocktail though, right? It is, absolutely. Um, actually, uh, right on Royal Street, uh, that is where Antoine Pechaud actually created these guys. Um, and, you know, he was a lodge member, and of course the lodge members, you know, they go and bitch about their wives and have cocktails. And so that's where that first cocktail uh, came about, really. Um, and uh, very proud to be in a city where uh, if it weren't for Antoine Pechaud and those lodge members, none of us would have jobs. So in your city, is it relatively easy to find people who want to learn the craft and who, are, who move there because they want to become better bartenders? Absolutely. I think um, that's what I'm very proud of our entire uh, community now is people are coming down to New Orleans to learn from some great people. We've got, you know, Chris Hanna, Stephen Yamati, uh, uh, Jeff Beach Bumberry is opening up a tiki bar there, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, the guys who started it all uh, with Cure, bringing that New York style um, down. Uh, there, there's some amazing things happening down there and my job, I've always been restaurant specific, is bringing that type of cocktail culture into restaurants and people are very open to that and it's making a lot of money for restaurants. What would I do so. if I were in Minneapolis or Cincinnati or Portland, Maine and I'm not in a culture like you are where there's just tons of bartenders around, how am I gonna find somebody that brings that skill set or do I have to train them you myself? You know, I, I didn't wake up and become a cocktail bartender. You know, I, I worked in dive bars. I worked at, uh, you know, in, you know, I started off as a server and that's one of the reasons why I became a bartender. I was a great server. They're like, get her behind the bar. You know, so it's that type of thing. And what's great about at the level where we are, we've got really people that are enthusiastic about what we're doing coming to us and they're wanting to learn. And that is so humbling, and it's, it's an honor for me to teach. And obviously not to plug Tails, but Tails is a good opportunity to also learn the craft. Absolutely, huge. Yeah, uh, what uh, Ann Turnerman has done with, uh, with uh, Tales of the Cocktail has been great for everybody, not only just for New Orleans, bringing in you know, millions of dollars to uh, a great city in July when nobody wants to come in July, um, it also is a great, it's, it, it's now become kind of a family reunion uh, for all of us because, uh, you know, we, we have a small incestuous world um, in our cocktail community and now we all have a place where we can all meet up again and, and, and learn. Like, it's July 17th or so, 18th? I yeah, think, it's, yeah, it's in that uh, third week. Okay, so, so uh, Sazerac, to take us through this. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I totally love Sazerac because uh, I'm a boozy girl. I consider myself a whiskey evangelist. So uh, that's uh, one thing that I found a very um, interesting about this whole whiskey, uh, whiskey huge thing and the shortage and stuff. There are more, uh, there's a reason why there's a whiskey shortage. I mean, it's really like futures. You know, everything, you know, by law, it has to be at least two years, but a lot of it's age six, eight, 10, 12, you know, all those type of years. They had no idea that people were gonna be really into whiskey and uh, I know, Josh and Charles and I are probably a big part of the shortage. Um, but, um, but there's a huge reason why that's happening too because more women are drinking whiskey. Mm. And that's what I'm finding really, really happy. That, uh, I'm really happy about that because um, it's, it's something that's very personal to me because I've always, I'm a Southern girl, you know, I'm a whiskey girl, you know, and uh, I'm seeing more and more women drinking whiskey and rather than vodka soda, you know, and there's still those and they make me mode, they make me money and trust me, when I'm three deep at the bar, I'm very grateful for the vodka soda. I'm very grateful, you know, but. but I mean, Beam has tried to capitalize on that. They've created some special like cherry lines. Oh, uh, don't right? even get me started but they, on but that. They, but they feel like that the, yeah, the female audience is a potentially big audience for them, right? Well, exactly, and I hope to teach 
teach Jim Beam to stop it. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, you, know, you put some ice in. I want you to weigh in on ice because you didn't have a chance to weigh in. These two well, I think like it all depends draft. on what you're doing. Um, what they're doing at the aviary is a whole different style, and this is why we're talking about you know restaurants and cocktail programs and stuff. It's a matter of what your restaurants feel is going to be and what kind of volume you're going to have and all that kind of stuff. If he was a place that's like three deep and hundreds of people, there's no way that you can really kind of do that. Well, I guess he could because he's Charles. He could do it. Uh, but um, for our type of thing, I'm, I'm an old school bartender and everything. I'm a person that I listen to my eyes. Um, and also with cold draft, um, I always joke with uh, Neil uh, Bodenheimer, who opened up Cure in Belloc. Uh, he's right next door at Belloc. And uh, it's like, a, you know that scene in A Christmas Story in which uh, the dad is fighting with the boiler and screaming? It's him every weekend. And it always happens on a Saturday night. It never happens on a Monday afternoon. With his ice machine. With these ice machines. And hopefully Hoshisaki is going to get us some better ice. Um, you know, but I think it's really just training your bartenders to listen to the ice. Um, uh, I think that's the best way to really kind of do it. So does that mean like? This is just to chill the glass. Yeah, absolutely. It's like if you're shaking to the ice. and all that, you feel it. And you can also just hear it. OK. Um, and it's, it's from experience. That's something that I really can't teach. It's just something that you're going to learn over years. And what we're going to be doing with this cocktail is uh, seeing a wash line. Um, and so I'm using uh, two ounces of Rittenhouse, which I adore. Um, I, I'm a huge bonded whiskey girl. Um, I actually have a bonded flight, bondage flight on uh, the uh, Tivoli and Lee uh, What does cocktail? that mean, by the way, when you say bonded? Uh, depends on the night. Um, but but <laughs> no, uh, the, the bonded whiskey, um, it's uh, something that's uh, Basically because of prohibition, um, it has to be aged at least two years. It's bottled in bond, it's put aside, the taxes are kind of prepaid, and that's why I think this is some of the best value whiskey that you can find. Okay. Um, and I love Pappies and all that other kind of stuff, but there's not really, this is gonna be a killer value. I will actually take a shot of Rittenhouse before I'll take a shot of Pappy, just because, you know, why would I take a shot of 25 year old, $25 whiskey? Um, and it's delicious, and I did um, probably about two hours ago. But, um, but there's, there's not that need for it, especially when you've got something as beautiful, and this is a high, I mean, this is a rye whiskey, super boozy, and that's why I use two ounces. I'm using something like a Sazerac rye or Old Overholt or any of that kind of stuff. I use two and a quarter ounces exactly. because that proof is not there. This is also has to be, by law, uh, 100 proof. So, you know, it's me. It's got to have a lot of cowbell. All right. Uh, a lot so, of cowbell. anyway, <laughs> we've Clearly, got that. I mean, I, I mean exactly. guess you're an advocate for someone behind the stick who's got some personality. <laughs> well, because, that's, right? that is 90% of your job. And open up your wallet. And open right? up your wallet. Yeah. Oh, that's, it's yeah. always about <laughs> yeah. the dollar. All right. Um, so, that was a little simple syrup? That's just a quarter ounce of simple syrup, and I used a two to one also because I really don't want to really super dilute this drink. Um, so, and then we have the uh, Peychaud's bitters, and I do a healthy dose. I know New York likes to stick a little ango in it. Not for me. I have um, seen an explosion, by the way, guys, of bitters. Uh, everybody that I know is doing bitter, bittered sling, bitterman's. Is, is it all good stuff? Is it all something you should pay attention to? Or is well, it all I, I consider sugar to be the salt for a bartender, and I consider bitters to be kind of the spice cabinet. So I, th I think that's kind of the way that, uh, that I really look at it. Um, uh, it's because there's so many bitters out there. Yeah. Um, I'm not really personally at my bar into making my own bitters because the consistency. Um, I like to have, you know, straight consistency. There are people that are really good. There are great bitters out there that I can use. Now, I've seen people in Chicago, like at Longman and Eagle, they'll say 40 stirs. 42 stirs. Well, Are you that yeah, cool? there's definitely a lot of that, but once again, listening to the ice and stuff, and right here, I'm looking for a wash line. Uh, so I filled it with ice, and then I'm basically making sure that all the liquor is washing the ice. Oh, so okay. you, all right. you want the ice to have a bath and some whiskey. And would, you, would you be particular above. about the type of ice in this case if you had your druthers? No, no. Uh, I'm actually, um, I'm totally fine with this. Um, of course, if I can have a Hoshizaki or any of that, I really love crushed ice machines because I really, really hate dealing with Lewis bags. Um, Lewis bags are those bags you put the ice into and then whack with the... Exactly. Okay. So another thing, this is also New Orleans boy we have to thank for um, bringing in uh, absinthe. Um, he actually uh, was a chemical engineer, and him and his chemical engineer nerds uh, were uh, trying to figure out um, 
why absinthe was illegal, and he's also a huge Francophile and went over to France and by well, serendipity found uh, two pre-prohibition absinths. I wanted to ask you about that twist, though. That was a pretty serious technique. Well, that, that, you just that, went over that. That's my one bit of flair. Trust me, you don't okay, want any. One bit of flair. <laughs> yeah, right. absolutely. That's it. That's all I got. But it was it was an uh, absinthe rinse. Yeah, it's an absinthe rinse. Okay. You can also use atomizers, things of that nature. You want a little bit of that for the aromatics, that and that's really about it. Um, okay. um, I did cheat and I. Uh, did, oh God, no, awesome, because that's dry. Um, and uh, the lemon zest, and we were talking about uh, adding a zest also. I can't tell you how many cocktails I've created, and I'm like, oh, it just needs a little something, and just a spritz of that oil just will completely change a cocktail. Hmm. And how inexpensive is that? And uh, next thing you know, that's, that's being reordered, and it's making you money behind the bar. And you save the fruit and juice it. And you day. save the fruit and juice it. All the scarred fruit you do, you do, do it the, the next day. Yeah. Absolutely. Cheers. All right, to New Orleans. All right, cheers. Cheers. Mm. Who dat? Who dat? Who dat? Awesome. Lovely. That is wonderful. Thanks. Wow. Um, okay. We've got a little bit of time here. I want, uh, a couple more. I'm going to leave some time for questions too, by the way. But um, Josh, you and I were talking earlier about. Um, Cutting citrus, not too early, because you don't want to get too far ahead of the game because there's some problems with that. Tell me about that. Sure. So this sort of falls in next in line with the juice that I was bringing up earlier. It's really important. There's a lot of waste in bars. And with a little bit of thought, I mean, people create juice logs. They create pars for these sorts of things. And so particularly when you're a menu-driven establishment, which is a lot of what we're talking about today, you can know exactly what it is you need and how many you're going to need over the course of the night. And maybe you're going to have a, something different between Sunday and Wednesday and something different between Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But at the end of the day, you want to cut just enough of what you need so that at the end of the night, you throw away a couple. The thing that I despise the most, when you go into a bar, and they have a, their cups or whatever it is that they keep their garnishes in, and there are lime wedges, and the edges of the limes are brown. Ugh. It's... Like, I want to walk out of the establishment. I mean, how tough is it to cut two limes and put 16 lime wedges in a thing and throw it out? But because nobody is training them properly or, or, or there hasn't been the proper systems put in place, you revert back to, like, you know, the, the, the year 2000 when everything got a lime wedge and you come in and it's like you wedge up a half a case of limes and then you have all these limes there. It's, it's a simple gesture and really the example means so much more because these sorts of things will run through your entire bro pro bar program. But well, at the end of the day, you just want to be concise. Concise, and it's also um, being a restaurant-specific person, too. It's having that conversation with the chef um, as well about how much you need and if does, does he need juice, can you share, mm -hmm. can he use that in something, um, and all that kind of stuff. What is fresh, what is seasonal, what is he using on the menu. Um, so also, I can make my bar program make sense. I'm always a bar for the restaurant. It's never a restaurant for the bar. Um, and so that, that, that's definitely, I've always done programs in which I have to honor the food. You know, I've got uh, Chef Marcus back there that I uh, was really, you know, honored to work with. And uh, when he was doing modern southern food, it, you know, of course we're going to have southern ingredients, whiskey, come on. Uh, you know, it would make no sense to have a gin bar um, and that kind of thing. And also talking about those seasonal ingredients, and in Louisiana we have very specific uh, local ingredients taking advantage of that. What about, this is a toss up for any of you, uh, the issue of sort of creativity versus commerce. You clearly need to make money. Um, you wanna create things that will sell. You wanna reorder bottles. You don't want them sitting on your shelf. Uh, but at the same time, you wanna be creative, right? You wanna do things that speak to you as a, as a creative person, as a bartender. Um, I'm guessing in your case, they come to the AVR because they wanna be wowed and they're Alice in Wonderland kind of, kind of thing. But at the end of the day, I mean, you gotta make something that people are gonna buy. Right, and you, you definitely don't want to be uh, too esoteric. I think what, you know, what we're talking about is not revolutionary. It's, we're taking what you have done in your kitchens forever, uh, pars, ordering responsibly, not having huge amounts of waste, and applying that to the, to the bar. Um, now, your program needs to make sense as well. And, and um, I, I'm actually, is, is, uh, uh, in depth as that we get uh, at the aviary, uh, I'm, I'm pretty simple when I'm when I'm designing, uh, and then we kind of build that. I never put something in a cocktail just so because it, it, it sounds good. It's actually one of my pet peeves when you read a laundry list of ingredients and you're like, 
and you taste the drink, you're like, oh, that's playing no role whatsoever. If you were cooking a dish, you wouldn't put in some superfluous spice just because it sounded cool. Uh, and, and so if it's not playing a role, if it's not contributing or balancing, get rid of it. Um, you know, you're, you're wasting ink on the, the menu, uh, you're wasting money on the, on the ingredient, and you're, you're kind of stroking your own ego a little bit. Um, so I think simple is, is fine. Uh, and you know, you're talking about creative, work seasonally. Your kitchens are going to do that, and that's the expectation, so why wouldn't your bar do that? Uh, if you're serving um, you know, blueberry mojitos in, in December, something might be wrong. You, know? we might, you want to use, use stuff when it's best, uh, and you know, it's, going to, it's going to taste freshest. Tomatoes do not taste uh, in January the way they, they taste in August. Uh, so you know, we'll have drinks, and people will be like, oh, I want that Bloody Mary riff that you did. Yeah, tomatoes taste like cardboard right now, so I'm not making that cocktail. Uh, you know, and it gives your guests something to look forward to. It shows that you're, you're putting attention. Uh, it's giving them something new when they come back to your bar. Uh, and the beautiful thing about cocktails, I can go out to dinner uh, regularly when I go out to dinner. I would say that 60%, uh, 70% of my tab is beverage when I'm going out because you can have three cocktails a piece if you're a, a two-top, now you're in six cocktails, uh, but I'm only going to order one, one entree. Right? So if that's a $27 entree, now I've ordered 14 times 6 cocktails, you know, and then we've got, it's a serious part of your tab. And your margins are always going to be better on beverage than they are on food. Less, less expensive labor, less expensive produce going into it. Uh, you're generally running 18, 20% cost. If you can't hit 20% on beverage, something again is wrong, and you can get way below that. You have your loss leaders, you balance them out. Um, this is a money-making proposition. Um, we all need to pay rent and, and keep the doors open while we're putting out a great product. Um, you know, the, the aviary is an exception in certain ways because of the type of service we want to put forth that we run broader margins. Yeah. But that, is, that comes along with the spinoff of a fine dining yeah. place. Do you agree, either of you, with this? I absolutely agree with that. And it's also um, with a restaurant, once again, it's, uh, there's always issues like somebody's steak was overcooked or somebody thought it was coming too long or any of that kind of stuff. And so a lot of uh, it's training the staff and also training the managers too, it's like, don't comp off that steak, comp off that drink because that drink costs you $1.30 or whatever, that steak costs you $6. So it's, that's one of the reasons why a bar program is so important too, is we're able to be a release valve um, for, for issues that happen that way. Um, and it's restaurant, it's always gonna happen. Um, and a lot of times it's just to hush them up a little bit, but, um, but they're happy with just that drink. You don't have to comp off a $23 steak. You can comp off a $10 drink and then you're going to be making more money. And, um, and also the thing with the uh, drinks as well is that's going to be a repeat thing. They like that drink. They're going to order another one. So instead of $10, now it's $20, now it's 30 cause they liked it again. And so you're going to be getting more money with a higher profit margin and that's going to make everybody make more money and um, hopefully honoring what they're doing in the kitchen as well. You're nodding your head. Yeah. I agree with everybody. Okay. Yeah. Any questions for anybody? Um, why not? We got a couple questions here right in front here. Sarah's got a microphone. She'd be happy to come to you. Just tell us where you're from and. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pretty, but I work at the Montage in Beverly Hills. Um, I get asked a question a lot about the resurgence of cider. Uh, mm. There are a lot of bars in Los Angeles that are coming up with distinctive cider-based cocktails. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just curious to understand, like, Josh, what is your take on this in terms of the evolution? One of the things that I can pin it on is uh, an increase in people claiming gluten intolerance, mm -hmm. which is very real, and I'm seeing uh, a lot of people, particularly in California, this is, you know, we're a very health-conscious place and just nonstop, it's like gluten, gluten, gluten. And previously, ciders were sort of was like a girly thing. If you're a girl, you had a cider. And now there's such a broad array of ciders. There's dry ciders, sweet ciders, mass commercially produced ciders, local ciders. Uh, you know, guys and girls alike of all ages, we're seeing call ciders. Do you have a cider? We actually carry a couple different ciders. We've done, of the three menus we've done at Trick Dog, one cider cocktail with a vermouth base, which probably sold in the middle of our list. And on the menu that's coming up July 7th. We run all our menus for six months. The menu that's coming up on July 7th, there will be cider in the cocktail that sells the best. 
and we sort of have a grid of the things that we put into certain cocktails. We sort of know how they're going to sell, and this one is going to be our number one seller. We'll probably sell between 70 and 120 a night, depending on what night of the week it is, and it's going to be topped with cider. Um, are you wondering if ciders are being used in cocktails or just ciders sold in general? Well, I'm curious about the cocktail revolution. Cocktail. It looks like it is being made, made kind of a primary ingredient, like topping with white cider. Mm -hmm. you know, Are you seeing it in Chicago and New Orleans? Well, curiosity? yeah, definitely. And beer cocktails have been uh, something I would say in the past two years we've seen a resurgence of it, you know, um, besides uh, shandies and things of that nature. Um, but there's also different things that you can really do with beer. And don't just stick with just cider. There are gorgeous sour beers out there mm -hmm. that make great cocktail ingredients, um, even using stouts and actually cooking down. I have a cocktail that's a, a take on a whiskey sour and a beer in a shot called the White Chews. And it's using a, a Irish whiskey and an IPA beer syrup. So, um, and so you can actually make syrups out of certain beers as well. So there's five million things that don't sit there. It's like I need a cider cocktail. Start working with all sorts of different beers. And so if somebody's asking for that cider or a cider cocktail, you're like, you might be into this one, and you can turn them on to that as well. So I, I have it's a education of the staff. I have a partner in Los Angeles. We go down there a lot, and I think that. You know, uh, I totally agree with what you're saying, but you're going to have two very drastically different results if you have the same cocktail, one with cider and one with stout in it. And mm. cider, cider is going to be something that is going to have, uh, you know, I sort of always talk about trying to cast a wide net. Cider is going to cast a wide net. You could take a cocktail that was sort of middle of the road. I mean, another thing I'm sure you're seeing as well, uh, we're dealing with a much savvier client and customer base mm -hmm. in 2014 than we were a long time ago. And just like you said, the girl that you had pegged for a vodka soda, no fruit, is coming in and ordering a rye Manhattan. She's calling a rye. It's, it's pretty cool. So you could take a cocktail that was you know, a, a gin or a rye, some lime juice and some simple syrup and topless cider with a big mint sprig, and you're gonna have guys and girls ordering this alike, particularly down at the hotel if you guys are doing pool business. Uh, you know, I right, think the, like, and, the, and the, only the only caveat to that, again, is that you have to cost that in as an ingredient, and you will have waste at the end of the night, Definitely. or your staff's going to drink the open can. Oh, Charles, weigh in on that. Yeah, I, I think like what the, in the bigger picture, no ingredient is off limits. So you've, if you've got these beers in, in house, you've got these ciders in house, or you're using sherry. So now I could not only put that on a glass pour of these sherries, but I'm, I'm utilizing it in a cocktail as well. So I'm going to be going through it. I'm going to have fresh bottles open. It just gives you a, a greater depth to your program. The first thing, uh, if I were going to help someone get a cocktail program going, the first thing I would do is walk into their walk-in cooler that mm -hmm. their kitchen's already using. Instead of bringing in a bunch of new ingredients, why, why not use what you already have? And cross-utilization is, is just makes sense. Uh, to do that. Your, sh your chef's probably working seasonally already, going back to that point, and so why not use those, bring that stuff to the bar. And but that also helps your chef's cost as well. Absolutely. You're, so you're turning over products. Your food cost, uh, so. But wine, beer, any of this stuff can all go into cocktails. There's absolutely no reason it can. Gentleman in the back got a question. Wasn't that you? Crazy gentleman back there from, from Chicago, I'm guessing. Um, I'm curious. So for years and years, chefs have taken serviceware, plateware, as a creative jumping off point for, for food, for the cuisine that they create. Then sommeliers came on board. There used to be a white wine glass, a red wine glass, and a champagne flute. And now you can see an entire repertoire of glassware for Rieslings and Sauternes and Ports and vintage champagne and non-vintage champagne and so on and so forth. How does the panel feel about the current wave of cocktail specific glassware and then going even further, creating special glassware for unique cocktails. That gentleman might have a career in this. Well, <laughs> th th I, I've got a few things on that, especially if uh, you're talking about, you know, kind of like having um, the whole wine thing and having five million different glasses for wine. That's, that's great if you have a wine program. Uh, for me, for cocktails, for my place, and it's only for our type of places and everything. First of all, I would love to see the death of the V martini glass. Uh, nobody knows how to walk with them. Um, they are too big and they're stupid. I just hate them. Um, <laughs> I absolutely hate them. There's no way to stack them. And there's no way to keep them chilled properly. I would love the death of that. Um, but um, for me, whenever I see really interesting glassware, 
Um, you know, like there's some people that'll just uh, go to vintage shops and they'll have different glasses and it's really cool looking. But the first thing is one, one is gonna be filled to the rim, the other one's gonna be down to this and they're gonna say, why is it not filled? And second of all, I'm like, okay, so how many of these get stolen tonight? So, cause I'm always about that cost too. I'm all about breakage costs cause that goes into your profit and losses and stuff like that. So I, you know, I hate to say it, I'm a Libby girl. You know, it's just, you know, there's a reason why Libby works for at least the concepts that I work for uh, because the breakage is less um, and there's standard pours. Um, I prefer coupe glasses and any sort of uh, martinis or daiquiris or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it, it just works and it's also low cost because they're a huge magnet. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a magnet, but it also depends on what kind of style bar you have. Absolutely. What I, I do, it's not key. gonna make sense the for type what they venue. do. It's, so, it's so venue specific because, it's venue and it specific. goes down to your training. Uh, we design, uh, have custom designed glassware, uh, things that have been uh, done. A company, you, right, you, Crucial Detail? Yeah, so uh, we've worked with a designer in, in Chicago who's uh, Martin Kastner from uh, Crucial Detail. He's done a bunch of service pieces for us, uh, as well as dishes uh, and serviceware for Alinea and our other venues. Um, and these pieces are, are expensive. It just goes to how your staff respects the, the venue, how they res respect the serviceware. Uh, and it is, um, and that's the culture that you built. And that is, it, and. If you say, well, our staff can't do that, then you're not in control of your restaurant. Um, and and that's, just, that's just the way it is. What I do you mean, think about his question about the last one? I think, I think all the points you made are totally correct, and I think that we've started to see it in a similar way. Obviously very concept-based. There's a lot of stuff that we wanted to do at Trick Dog, and you know, a lot of glassware that I think is extremely beautiful, but it, would just, it wouldn't make it through our high-pressure washers. We'd go through too much right. volume. One of the things that it sort of comes into is the glassware almost becomes an ingredient of the drink, the same as any of these other elements. And so there's a, you know, the, the whole idea of, of the cocktail passing by that draws people to it. One of the things that we talk a lot about at Trick Dog is creating uh, items that are craveable. Like, what's the craveability of this? And when people leave here, are they going to come back and they're going to say, oh my God, I, I have to have another gypsy tan. That's the drink that I can't stop thinking about. Or, you know, I, I have to have this burger. And I'm sure all of you know those different drinks or, or items of food that you've had at various restaurants you think about all the time. And that's why they're your neighborhood restaurant or whatnot. Yeah. We did a drink, uh, one menu. We went on Amazon. We bought these little ceramic pineapple cups with a lid and a hole for a straw cost us about three bucks a piece. We bought a ton of cases of them. We ran one drink in this, and it's like the next thing you know, you see pineapple cups all over the room. Mm -hmm. you know, so you can have a lot of fun with the glassware. I mean, sort of the Moscow Mule thing. It's like brass mugs start going out, you pick that one drink, do something fun and interesting. That's what it is. It just all needs to be fun. The bartenders yeah, and the customers well, are having fun. And also with that glassware, we're like with uh, Moscow mules and stuff like that, because those copper mugs yeah. are really expensive and stuff like that, but there are brands that are willing to pay for it too. Right. So uh, it's also talking and having good relationships with brands as well. So I mean, Glass there's, a, companies there's a way to work taking an notice angle. though too. And, and Libby has focused on and even has inexpensive stems that are classically styled. They actually right. moved totally. glasses that were all over their book five years ago, all together in two pages now that are retro looking mm -hmm. glasses and are that, that are, it's a direct note from them, notice from them that they see the classic cocktail yeah. movement and, yep. and have put all of these types, and those are two bucks a stem. Yeah. So, and, and pretty durable as well, very durable. Any questions? No other questions. Wow. Um, I had one more question for you all, it was about, um, uh, oh, the collaboration between the, the kitchen and the, the bar. You hate the term bar chef. Hate I won't, it. I won't utter it again. But what about, the, there has to be a, this sort of symbiotic relationship between the kitchen, the bar, the person at the bar is, in a sense, a chef. Like it, it, well, uh, right? that, that, that's why I really don't, really, and this is just a personal thing. Everybody has their own uh, feelings about it. But, you know, I started off as a server and then I made my way up to bartender and all that kind of stuff. And also, I don't think there's anything wrong with being called a bartender. I'm very proud to be a bartender. And, you know, so I, yeah, I yeah. think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that term. And also, chefs work hard from being cooks to sous and all that other kind of stuff. They earn the right to be called chefs as well. And I don't need to take another term from somebody else. 
And um, so that's just my own personal thing. Everybody wants to go. I also call myself a hooch manipulator or a whiskey evangelist. It doesn't really matter, you know. But but that one, I don't want to take it you because know, also I'm restaurant specific as well. I don't want somebody calling me a bar chef when I already am working with a chef. Um, and but, that's, but, that's but, just but a that goes my question. So how do you work with the kitchen to make it successful in the bar program? By talking talking with the chef. You know, when he's getting ready to change things seasonally, you talk with them. Uh, it's like Marcus and I have had, you know, many late night talks over whiskey uh, about different uh, things that we want to put on the menu. You know, he's got ideas of the food, and then it's my job to design those drinks that are going to match his food. Okay. Once again, bar for the restaurant, not restaurant for the bar. There needs to be continuity there. It's the, it, the menus need to make sense together. You need to know that they're from the same venue. Uh, they should they should definitely follow suit with one another. And, you know, if your bartenders go in and clean up after themselves and put stuff back where they found it, then they'll they'll make friends with the chef. And I think everyone in this room, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, know the further relationship between the kitchen and the bar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, uh, a a symbiotic a symbiotic relationship there where uh, supply and demand comes into effect. Definitely. So. Well, this has been not only thirst quenching but fascinating for me, and I really appreciate you all taking some time to share your expertise with us. Um, yeah, you can applaud. Absolutely. <laughs> you can applaud. Um, we have a happy hour going on. Literally, when you leave these doors, Charles will be there. Maybe Dave Arnold will be there. If not, maybe this gentleman will slip in, but we don't know. I know Booker and Dax's cocktails will be there for sure from New York. Um, Amex Trade is the hashtag. FW Classic is the hashtag. At Briefing also. We'll be back here tomorrow morning at 9.15. A really interesting panel. Great panelists. Tom Colicchio. Stephanie Izard, Sean Brock talking about how to retain customers. So have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.